blessing upon our soul. Father, we ask of you to burn sin from out of our lives. Help us, Lord, to be more like you. Father, as we come, we pray, Lord, that we come to be revived. We come to hear a word from you, and we know that you will not disappoint us. Father, we ask of you at this moment to anoint your man servants once again with power from on high. We ask of you tonight, Lord, to open our ears and our heart to your word. We pray, oh Lord, tonight that you will call someone name, call out someone name, and they will answer to your call, oh God. We pray for this community in a very special way, Lord. We pray that your Holy Spirit will walk up and down the lane and the street and the highways. And we pray, O oh God, that those that to be saved will hear your manservant voice and hearken to the cry. Continue to let your presence be with us. Continue to guide and to protect us. Let your presence continue to infill us with your holy presence. Lord, we are happy to be here once again, and we ask of you to rest and abide with us. In Jesus' name, amen. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, everyone. How are we doing this evening? All right, you know, uh, I must say that the turnout for the nightly meetings have been good so far. And um, even tonight, we're expecting uh, the numbers to grow a little more. And um, one thing for certain, though, is that uh, we are a little bit disappointed in terms of the number of visitors we're seeing. But the brethren are coming out, and I want you to feel good about that. I congratulate the brethren, and, the brethren, and we feel good to see you, and we feel good to have you. But if you want our joy to be complete, then when you're coming out tomorrow night, grab a hold of somebody and bring them with you. Amen? Amen? So we can share the blessing. But it's my joy and it's my pleasure to welcome everyone tonight to the wonderful words of life gospel crusade and uh, you know our own pastor evangelist Delroy Clark has been preaching up a storm um, starting from last week throughout our week of prayer and uh, into this week which is more evangelistically focused so pastor Clark will be coming tonight and um, I ask that as he prepares himself to come, you know, that we will all continue to pray him up. But right now, we're welcoming each other. And we're going to be singing our welcome song. And um, we want people to get up out of their seats and greet somebody in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Smile a while. face a rest. Raise your hands to the one you love the best. Then shake hands with those nearby. And move, shake hands, not sitting in the seat. Mm -hmm. So, thank you again. Smile a while and give your face a rest. Raise your hands to the one you love the best. Then shake hands with those nearby. And smile and smile and smile.
All right. Tonight, I didn't come up here empty-handed. I came up here bearing gifts, right? And um, I have two very special books with me. Uh, one is When God Said, Remember, and this is by Pastor Mark Finley. A very interesting little book, very powerful, pocket-sized book. You can put it in your pocket and take it anywhere with you. And um, this by Ellen G. White, The Great Controversy. In a time like this, this is the book that reads like uh, today's gleaner or today's paper. You need a book like this. So tonight, I am going to give the first book to the visitor. Visitor in our brethren. Remember, I said visitor. That is here for the very first time. You weren't here last week. You didn't come any time last week. But you're here tonight, and you would like a copy of this book. We have a visitor here. Amen, brethren. Amen. Give him my amen. All right. Come, just come forward and, 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 and uh, claim your book for me, please. Amen, amen brethren. All right, here you go. May God bless you. I hope you read it and read your way into the kingdom of God. Now, this book, whether or not I give out this book is contingent, is dependent upon whether or not the brethren have been bringing out visitors. This book is for the member that has brought out three visitors tonight. Anybody here? All right. Sister Jared said I must come down a little bit. Anybody that has brought out two and a half visitors? <laughs> no one here? Two and a half? All right, talk about two. Two? Sister, <laughs> Sister Spence brought out two visitors? All right, Sister Spence, I'm going to give you this book to give to one of your visitors. <laughs> All right? I right, thank you, brethren. Uh, we are now going to have our offering. President, good night, church. Good night. It's that special time of the night. Giving. The, the question is being asked, can a man rob God? The answer is yes, a man can rob God. How can a man rob God? In the giving of tithes and offering. So give what you've got even if it's a little bit, because little is much. Amen. Let us pray. Stand for prayer, please, and thanks. Most right and eternal God, thank you, dear Jesus, that you give us the strength to go and work, to gather what we need to gather for our family and for ourselves. And we return back a portion to give you, dear Jesus to the work, for your work to continue and to help to build up for your kingdom, dear Jesus. Thank you for what is said and done and what is about to take place. As we tell your thanks in your matchless name. Amen. Give, and it will come back to you. Full measure, press down, shake it together and run it over. come back to you as you give give to the Lord give and it will come back to you good measure press down shaken together and running over give and it will come back to you as you give Brethren, 
prayer can't be too much. In a time as this that we are living in, we need more prayer, more prayer, more power. At this time, we'll form ourselves in groups of two. And we have different struggles. Pray for each other that we will remain faithful to go home with Christ when he come. And if the other person is not yet saved, pray them up that whatsoever struggle they are holding on to, that God will release them of that struggle. Okay? Time for prayer groups of two. Pray on for you are who the Lord is looking for. Pray on for this will tear those my... All right, so tonight we are going to be blessed with special music as our song of meditation comes to us from vocal chords. Uh-huh. 
heart I'm rejoicing Oh, I wish they could see Thank you, Lord, for your blessings on me There's a roof up above me food on my table and shoes on my feet you gave me a love lord and a fine family thank you lord for your blessings on me now i know Angeles, Pastor Delroy Clark is here and he is waiting to present the word from the throne room of grace. I know you have been praying for him and uh, I know that the Lord has been using him thus far. Amen. And I'm sure that the Lord has a message in store for us tonight, which will come through his chosen vessel. But before pastor comes, the praise team will come once again and sing the theme song.
Amen. Amen. It is exciting and at the same time solemn to consider just the theme that we are working under. Wonderful words of life. You know, I spent some time today meditating the word of God because I'm always in the word. To tell you the truth, I spend most of my time in the word. I almost don't do anything else except the word. <laughs> and I am convinced that the words are more than wonderful. And after years of reading, meditating, contemplating on the word of God, I've come to the conclusion that nothing in life is more important, valuable, life-changing, life-sustaining than the word of God. But I am keenly aware that particularly for people who are coming to the Lord for the first time, are opening the words for the first time, it is necessary that you should get some basic instructions that would help you along. <laughs> Otherwise, it is possible for you to stumble a long time before you get in steady waters. And so I'm trying in my approach to speak to those things that I think you will need to give you a basic understanding as you go through the word of God and that will cement you in the word. It is with that in mind that I have chosen my subjects, my topics, or sometimes the stories, the segment of scripture that I'm going to talk about very carefully. It is not by accident that these texts are chosen. And I want you to pay proper attention because there are lessons to be learned from every one of them. Life-changing lessons. And in some cases, we will give to you the formula to unlock eternal power and eternal life. Tonight... I want us to meditate on Matthew chapter 15. Uh, not all of it, just one segment, a story. And uh, it, it, Matthew chapter 15. Turn your Bibles, your device, whatever you have, to the 15th chapter of Matthew. And we take it from verse 21. We read a couple of verses together, please. Then Jesus went thence and departed into the coast of Tyre and the Sidon. And behold, a woman of Canaan came out of the same coast and cried unto him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with a devil. But he answered her not a word. Together, please. And his disciples came and besought him, saying, Send her away, for she crieth after us. But he answered and said, I am not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Then came she and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. But he answered and said, it is not me to take the children's bread and to cast it to dogs. And she said, Truth, Lord, yet the dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered and said unto her, O oh, woman, great is thy faith. Be it unto thee even as thou wilt. 
and their daughter was made whole from that very hour. And Jesus departed from thence and came nigh into the Sea of Galilee and uh, so forth. This is where I am pitching my tent. Uh, verse 27. And she said, Truth, Lord, yet the dogs eat the crumbs which fall from their master's table. Title of my message tonight is Truth, Lord, yet. I extract it from the text and I do it deliberately because I don't want you to forget that. profound yet simple thought expressed by this woman in these brief words. Truth, Lord, yet let us pray. O oh Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you that every night you have given us signs of your presence in our midst. We ask, Lord, that as we open this word tonight, and as we seek to learn from your word how to handle the word and how to respond to the word and how to deal with the word, we ask, Lord, that you will bring salvation to us tonight, that we will be blessed as this woman was blessed, that our attitude will be as your word. Help us to bow before your word with humble attitude. In Jesus' name, amen. Even when the word of God appear unsavory and distasteful to us. Truth, Lord, yet. This story of this woman and our encounter with the Lord is singular. There is none like it in scripture. And I dare say, even outside of it, I have not read or heard of any story even remotely resembling anything like this. The faith of the woman. The seeming harsh words of the Lord. This story gathers a lot of interest from the very fact that Jesus, it's the only time it records Jesus going to the very borders of Tyre and Sidon. Of course, Sister White is careful to tell us in um, these half ages that this is the, and we know that theologians have also said it uh, often in their writings, that this and the biblical record attest to it so that there is no way we could get around it. But this is the longest journey that the Lord has ever taken while he was on earth. He was in Galilee preaching and teaching. When suddenly he broke off the sermon, cutting short, and he said to the disciples, we are going to take a rest. Let's go and walk. Little did they know that the Lord was going to travel almost a hundred miles on foot with them. Because the Bible records Jesus is traveling, that he always walk wherever he's going. I, 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 it's another sermon for another time for us to contemplate. Why walk? The Lord always walked. The only time it's recorded, he took the Cadillac out and jump into it was when he was going into Jerusalem and then it was a borrowed donkey anyhow 
<laughs> but he always walked, and, and there was a reason for it. And uh, I believe the reason come out with anybody who read the story of the Lord. But he's walking, and walking into hidden territory. The story is interesting as it's presented to us in the book of Matthew. I, I apologize because the story is also in Mark chapter 7. I chose Matthew for no other reason that I kind of like Matthew. <laughs> I could have I just as well preached from Mark. But to tell you the truth, my only reason for choosing Matthew is that from I was converted, there is no particular reason why I like Matthew. I just find myself like Matthew. <laughs> So if Matthew has a story and some other gospel of it, I almost invariably use Matthew. I apologize because I'm not doing it because Matthew is better than Mark or has greater philosophy or anything. I'm just doing it because of personal um, taste. But I will refer to Mark since Mark has this story, I will refer to it every now and again so as not to make you feel too uncomfortable if you're a Mark person. <laughs> Is that all right? So you forgive me. And you don't have to see me later to ask my pastor, why is it that you choose Matthew? Some people are so keen. <laughs> they ask you all kind of things. So that's my reason, actually. It's not because of anything with Mark. And... Uh, so I will refer to Mark. I hope I will. If I didn't, I apologize if I don't. But Jesus, Matthew said, Jesus departed and went into the course of Tyre and Sidon, verse 22, and behold, a woman of Canaan came out of the same course and cried unto him, saying, the picture that it brought to our mind is very arresting. We find Jesus coming from the land side towards the coast of Phoenicia. And now we find a woman coming up from the same coast towards Jesus. The woman had no idea that Jesus was so close to her because she didn't know he was coming. News apparently reached this woman about Jesus' power over demons. That demons fled from his very presence. And now her daughter is vexed with the devil. The demon is in her house and has possessed her daughter. I can almost imagine the trauma that this woman is going through to watch as the demon is playing football with her daughter. And there's nothing that she can do as he's dribbling her around and bouncing all over the place and sometimes move from football to basketball with her. <laughs> Just toying with her. And, and, and the mother said, she's grievously tormented. My daughter can have no peace and I can't have any sleep. And finally she decides, I, I, I am going to go to the, this Jewish messiah. She already know that she's a Phoenician woman. Syrophoenician as Mark calls her. A Syrophoenician woman. And she knows that the Jews don't like Gentiles, particularly Phoenicians. But she decided, I am going anyhow because that, that's the only place where I can find some peace for my daughter. So she's heading out of the coast to find Jesus and she heard that Jesus is in Galilee almost a hundred miles away and this poor old lady is now making up her mind brother Spence to walk 100 miles to get help for her daughter Jesus on the other hand knew the need already revealed by the spirit Jesus knew what was going on with this woman way over there? And Jesus said to the disciples, let's go. Jesus decided to walk the majority of the distance for the woman. I wanted to observe what is happening. 
She thought she's going 100 miles to meet Jesus. But Jesus is just going to meet her in the next town. <laughs> Close by. <laughs> I want you to look at what is happening. I love the way the Spirit brings the soul and the Savior together. So Jesus, the Bible says, the woman is coming up from the coast towards Galilee. Jesus is moving down from the land towards the coast to meet the woman. And they are about to rendezvous in this small unknown village. That's how the spirit draws the woman. And Jesus is coming. They are about to meet at the point designated by the Holy Ghost. I want to suggest to you that if you take one step towards the Savior, he will take 10,000. Like sometimes when you think that you are seeking God, it's God who is seeking you. <laughs> you don't understand what God is going through just to get you in the right position. This woman is about to meet Jesus at this place. The woman and Jesus is about to have make contact and the reasons for that is interesting because the bible makes it very clear that the devil has a part to play in why this woman is seeking jesus not because the devil wanted to seek jesus but the devil is tormenting the woman and the woman has made up her mind that what is happening in my house can't continue anymore i must see jesus I want to suggest to you, whoever you are, wherever you come from, that if the devil is plaguing you, it's a sign that you need Jesus. If the devil has taken over your life, the life of your family, your loved ones, your friends, it is a sign that it's time to meet Jesus. Every movement of Satan upon humanity it means that it's a sign for man to meet God. But this woman is coming. Finally, she heard she's in this little town. And news reach her that Jesus is there. I don't know how news get out. Because the Bible said in Mark chapter 7 and verse 24, the Bible is very careful to tell us that when Jesus went into this town, he entered into a house and would have no man know it. Did you notice those words from Mark? You lovers of Mark. Mark said, and Matthew didn't say, that he go back home. <laughs> so he said, don't let anybody know that I'm here, but he knows the business is out. The disciples were there. They knew what Jesus said, but the same part of the, the Savior came about from a person who really mean God. Let me tell you something. If you really want God, God can hide you out. A lot of you come here and you have a lot of demands, a lot of needs, a lot of situations. And you say, it seems as though God is hiding from me. Let me tell you, if you really mean God, you can't, he can't hide from you. God said, you shall seek me and you shall find me when you shall search for me with all your hearts. So God said, you will seek me and you will find me. And this woman is going to find him. The disciples came out. Ellen White, I like Ellen White rendition of the story. The disciples came out in the streets. They're walking. Some people, they point the woman to them. Those are Jesus' disciples. And the woman go up to them and is asking James and John, asking them, where is Jesus? Where is Jesus? But they're not talking. They're not telling. They say, woman, the master don't want anybody to know where he is. He's having his rest. He's enjoying his vacation. He's not here for business. They're not talking because Jesus gave them command. Nobody should know. But the woman is not stopping. She's pushing this because she can't stand seeing her daughter suffer. I don't know if you know what that is, to see a child suffer. But you would have to have suffering children to understand something like that. To see a child suffer is one of the greatest agony that a parent can bear. Especially when you love the child. And, and those of us who have seen our children sick, which would be most of us, suffering, <coughs> would understand. And those of us who bury our children understand how that sort of trauma, if, if a child die, 
I, I don't know if you have ever gone through any such experience. I would to God that you have no such experience to bear. I myself has gone through such um, predicament and don't want to repeat it. And pray to God that I would not repeat such an experience. But when a long time ago, a lot of people don't know, I had a daughter that died. And, and it traumatized my wife for over 20 odd years. Experience, not an easy thing. Take it from me. Not, not an easy thing. It, it, it has this way of traumatizing you. It messes with your psyche. It messes with your focus. It allows you to walk up and down and ask all kinds of questions to God and man. It allows the entire world to be transformed to see a suffering child or a dying child. Not easy. So this woman was going through extreme agony. And she wasn't about to allow any disciple of Jesus to stop her. A lesser person with a lesser need, perhaps, if it was even something for herself, probably when the disciples talked to her, she would run gone. But now she knows that it's her daughter and she's not giving up. She, she has made up her mind that, that I must see Jesus and, and he must deal with my condition. The situation must be had. And so they didn't tell her where Jesus was, but the woman somehow found the house where he was. Mark said he could not be hid because there was the woman with the daughter suffering. And so when she finds the house, she's pleading. I can almost picture the woman outside pleading, knocking and pleading, but nobody responding. Finally, Jesus decided to come out the house with the disciples, and they come out the house. The disciples, of course, would surround him everywhere, and he would be in the middle, and they were walking down the street. And the woman was behind them, shouting. And the Bible said, the woman is there shouting, verse 23, but he uh, shouting verse 22 first. And the, it gives us the word that the woman was shouting. She shout and she said, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with a devil. Have mercy on me, O Lord, you son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed. Have mercy. And she's crying for mercy. Crying out to Jesus. But the Bible said he answered her not a word. One of the worst things can happen to you, it, 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 it's an awfully humiliating thing to be ignored, especially when you're in trouble. Awful! I don't know if you've ever been sick and in trouble and you're ignored. I got sick once years ago and I, I, I went to, the, the, the folks rushed me to the, to the hospital. I don't like to get sick. I, when I get sick, I get real sick. <laughs> when, I, when, I, when I really get normal sick, I don't just sick like oh, some of you sick. When I'm sick, it's always serious and to death. I, I, I was doing some calporting years ago with, with, with Sister Fletcher and, and um, I don't know, I, I drank something and I just felt bad and, and I was out by holiday in, in Mobi and she said to me, go home. And, and I never forget it. I said, why are you telling me to go home? We just start. And we are, we are making good money. And people are buying our books. Man, the books were expensive in them days. Um, we were selling. Um, the books were selling like, some of them were even for $12 and $10. And we, we were selling them. The big books were for, for like $12. And I'm telling you, oh, it, 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 no, it was expensive. Those were cheap at these. You understand? <laughs> I'm talking about uh, from them about 40 years ago. Years ago. But, but, but it, the, the books were, 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 that was good money. And, and we were selling books. <laughs> People were buying books at the hotel. And, and finally she said to me, Delroy, I think you need to go home because you say I feel so good. And I said to her, but I feel good. We can do a few more rounds. And I said to her, I even give you some Bible study to some of these people and I'm liking it. And, 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 and she said, go home. So I went home and got on the bus. And I went into Mobile. Some of my friends were at their house and I went there. And when I went round to Jackie and Mackie, good friends of mine, Mark, he said, oh, you look so. I said, well, he said, you don't look so good. You know? I said, well, I don't know. Jackie said to me, come in the bedroom here, man. Come in our master bedroom. And I went in. She said, lie down on the bed. Mark, he said to me, put up your foot, party man. <laughs> Just relax yourself. <laughs> and um, I, I was there. And uh, I put up my foot. 
enjoying the nice bed. I fell asleep and I got up in the evening and realized I could hardly move. I took my time, jumped, got in a vehicle and went home. And I stayed in bed for the next four months. Never come out. I went in bed and by the next day I was so weak and so sick that when Brother Esme and others came to look for me, they said, no, man, you look serious. We have to carry you to a hospital. And they lift me up, put me in the thing, rushed me to a hospital. And I was there, real sick, in the outpatient section, real sick. And I tried to stand up, and the people were there with me. And um, I don't know, I fell and must have fainted or something. And the people cried out to the doctors and the nurses, no, go back, the man dead. They're so sick, I don't need to carry him. And they came and rushed me in and... They, they decide the doctor test me, and, and uh, when the doctor test me, I saw the good uh, doctor, you know, color a few fabrics from Pablo. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, when the doctor tests you, and as he tests you, so I'm going to Pablo. <laughs> The doctor said I'm dead too. Pablo, 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 Pablo. <laughs> and there was a nurse there that knew me and she said, oh, Brother Clark, what happened that doctor told her that this man here needs some seriously. You have to give him so much amount of penicillin and so much amount of stuff. And, and she took me home. I went, I went in the wheelchair around the corner and she said to me, man, this is serious. She looked at the thing that the doctor gave her. She said, no, you know what? I need to go back and test this with the doctor before I come back, Brother Clark. I said, to her, I could hardly talk. I said, what happened? She said, in all my over 40 years of in this nursing business, I have never had a doctor give me so much penicillin to give to one person. So I have to go and check it back. This must be wrong. And then she came back and she said, no, the doctor said, if you are to live, you have to get this. But she said, we have to test you. And she went and tested me. And I tell you, I got penicillin and just freeze up. And I was on penicillin every day for months. Not easy to be sick. I'm telling you, I, I have been sick a few times in my life. The only reason I'm here is the grace of God. <laughs> I, I don't know what you live by, but I live by the grace of God. I, I, I tell you, I, 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 I have been sick. I have been sick a time or two. And all the time. I, I was in the hospital once for more than eight months. And the doctors told my mommy and my mommy, uh, my sisters, they'll tell them. My doctor told, the doctor told them. And the doctor didn't even know I was hearing that you have to prepare the funeral service. Not why make it. But God had a different story. <laughs> So while the doctor and them were preparing the funeral service, God just touched me. And I just start getting better. And the doctor don't know how they're getting better. He just said, well, I make him go home. We don't know what happened to him, but he just start getting better. <laughs> and I went to him. But you know, to be sick and to have a loved one sick, it's not easy. And this woman was there. She came to Jesus, and Jesus is ignoring her. He answered not a word. She did everything that she knew she could do. She heard that Jesus was a loving man. That he had mercy on everybody. That he turns away nobody. And now she's pleading to his mercy and his conscience. Have mercy upon me. Notice what she's pleading to. Mercy. She said, I need mercy. I'm not here to ask for grace. I'm not here to ask for anything. I'm here for mercy. Just mercy, mercy, mercy. Not just grace. Mercy. Oh, Lord, your son of David. But Jesus answered her not a word. And his disciples, because she's shouting so loud in church, the Bible said that his disciples came and besought him, that is Jesus saying, send her away for she quiet after us. Notice the disciples. There is the woman making noise. Jesus is probably trying to teach them and talking and the woman is crying, have mercy on me. Jesus, your son of David, my 
daughter is grievously damaged. Help me. And Jesus is trying to preach. But the woman is loud and cantankerous in the church. And they can hardly hear what Jesus is saying. So the disciples come to Jesus. Thaddeus and Philip and others. They come to Jesus and they said to Jesus, listen. Send her away. They beg Jesus. Said, Do you tell him, Master? Send her away. Either you just help her or help her. But get rid of her. Because she cry after her. We can't take her in a church no more. Too much noise. She's a noisy worshiper. And we don't want her in our church. She's disturbing the service. She's disturbing everything. And now she's getting on our conscience. Oh, have mercy. Have mercy. Have mercy. And the woman not stopping. Have mercy. She begin to behave like some people in church that you want to shut up because you want to catch the next piece of the message but them shouting too much. <laughs> this woman was like that. She's making noise and they said to Jesus, send her away. But Jesus answered. Jesus opened his mouth but he's not talking to the woman. He's totally ignoring her, not even looking at her. He looked, turned to his disciples and he said to the disciples, I am not sent when they said, send her away or, or, or do something to her. Jesus said to the disciples, I am not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. I, I don't have anything to do with Gentile people. I am just here for the house of Israel. So I'm not talking to her, neither good nor bad. That's literally what Jesus was saying to them. That not even good nor bad. I have nothing to do with the woman. You ask, why is Jesus doing this? I'll tell you. Jesus is doing this because Jesus knew the faith that is inside of this woman. And Jesus is doing it in order to bring out the faith that is inside the woman. So that the disciples can understand how it is when somebody really needs God. Jesus knew what is in this woman and he knew what he can say to this woman. You know, Jesus treat this woman, he wouldn't treat you so I know you can't manage it. Jesus knew that the slightest little thing you run gone, that you use excuse for not come church, that even if you're in drizzle, you start, if I'm but should I, should I not, should I, should I not. Jesus knew that, that it doesn't take much to get rid of you. So Jesus wouldn't try it with you because Jesus knew that, that you just have to be a little thing and you're up on God. But Jesus knew what is inside this woman. God knows what he has placed deep down inside this fallen sister. And so you know he can talk to her like that because nothing can separate her. Nothing can get her away. And so Jesus turned him back at her and he's talking to them. And, and, and Jesus He's talking to them and lost sheep of the house of Israel. And while Jesus is saying that, the woman come blind him. The woman, as Jesus is talking and the disciples surround them, the woman come up while he's talking to them. And the woman did the unthinkable. She pressed through the disciples, parting them, something a woman should never do. And the Bible said she worshipped them, fell on her knees saying, Lord, help me. <clears throat> she's not paying any attention to what Jesus and the disciples are saying. She has her own agenda. One thing she can see is the devil and her daughter and Jesus before her who is the cure. And so she went right through. She stepped through the veil. Sometimes in order to get your blessing and your deliverance you have to learn to ignore people. One reason some of us can't get in the blessing is that we see too much people when we come to church. We can look and see how full the church is. We can look and see all the eyes on us. We can look our focus is too much on man and not on God. But she breaks through the veil and she's now on her knees before Jesus. The Bible said she worship him. She, she's in the air pleading and worship him. And, and this is better than making noise. It's good when she was making noise. And the Bible does say, make a joyful noise unto the Lord. But worship is, is a big leap from making noise. She's closer to God now. She's worshiping now. Lord, help me. I don't know if you have ever come to church and decide that you can't go home until God deal with your condition. Have you ever come to church like that? Have you ever come to God and decided you say, Lord, even if everybody left church tonight, I am the only one going to stay here because I can't go home, Lord, because my condition is of such. You have to deal with me tonight. Hallelujah. 
The majority of worshipers are not here to receive blessings from God. They care little or nothing about that. The majority of worshipers are time servers. They come to church only because it's a duty. And they have made up their mind of spending one hour. Whether they get a blessing or not, one hour. That you are get God, you get taking it from it. Verse 26. To take the children's children, nice people, and I can't take it and give it to dogs like you. What would you do when your word of God comes to you like this? I have known people who come to church and never come back simply because somebody looked upon them the wrong way. I've known people who come to church and leave because somebody says something to them where they never like. Me gone. This is not the pastor saying this to the woman. It's not the deacon. It's not the apostle. What would you do if you come to God and had so him talk to you? A lesser person would be up and gone. It is not me to take the children me and cast it to the dogs. I can't do it. I can't, I can't, I can't deal with you because you're a dog. The first thing that the majority of us would say, me now go back to that church there because the first time ago they didn't call me dog. I mean, I take it. I will call dog. Not because I am a Syrophoenician. I will not belong to your people. You, 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 you can't think you can address me like. Notice the woman. She didn't say it when Jesus said that. Observe what she said. And, and this is my message, actually. She said, Truth, Lord. Yet the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's team. Come on, I want to say amen. No wonder the Bible said, then Jesus said, Oh, woman, I'm hooking her up. Great is your faith. Say it again with the mirror. Uh, uh, Jesus wanted to get it out of her. But the woman looked at Jesus when Jesus said, But this is to give to the dogs. The woman, Jesus, look at the woman and hear what the, the woman said to Jesus. True, Lord, yet. True, Lord. Touch somebody beside you and say, True, Lord, yet. I'm going to tell you how to get blessings from God. If you're going to be blessed by God, the first thing you have to learn about the word of God is whatever the word of God says, you must admit that it's truth. Let me repeat this. In order to receive the blessing from God, whatever the word of God says, you must be willing to admit it as truth. No matter how rough it might sound, truth, Lord. No matter how tough it seems, truth, Lord. No matter how heart wrenching it seems, truth, Lord. The first thing you have to do in order to be blessed by God is to admit that God knows what He's saying. Truth, Lord. This is so profound. The word of God does not always come to us with nice things. There are some people who are at church and they just love nice sermons, smooth things, and sweet things. And, and they love when the pastor preached nice, titty bitty sermon. And they said, what was preached there in church? Boy, I don't really know what I'm saying about it. So sweet. <laughs> A lot of us like to be rubbed the right way and like it when it's nice. But the word of God is not always like that. Sometimes the word of God will cut you to your heart. Truth, Lord. Sometimes the word of God will say, Man, you know you're a liar. You need to give up your life. Truth, Lord. Yes, you know that you're an adulterer. You're in the church. Yes, you have office. But you're an adulterer. Truth, Lord. You have to learn to face the reality of God's word. Jesus looked at the woman and said, you're not a part of Israel. You, you lie like a dog, man. You live like a dog. You act like a dog. Truth, Lord. Truth, Lord. Truth. One of the primary things that we need in our life 
is to recognize that we don't know ourselves like how God knows us. That's why he's the God of truth. That's why the Bible is called the word of truth. That's why Jesus said it can o- you can only be sanctified through the truth. It's only the truth of God that can reveal the dog-like attitudes and passion that is locked up in us. Truth, Lord! And notice this woman, even when she admit the truth of God's word, she still wouldn't stop. Even though the word of God was harsh, and it was bitter, and it wasn't sweet, and it wasn't palatable, even when publicly Jesus said things to her like he never said to anybody else yet, it is not me to take the children food and cast it to dog. She looked at that and she said, truth Lord, you know it's not good, let me tell you something, it's never good for a beggar to argue while he's begging. <laughs> if you're a beggar, I, I don't want to argue, argue, but stop begging. But when you come to beg, whenever the man talk to you, don't argue with him. Learn to just humble yourself. And whatever I'm saying, truth, Lord, truth is that. There was a beggar that came to my place one time. I was with my friend, and my friend was a rough guy. And all him begin to say some real nasty thing to the beggar. I say, you're worthless, you're tan bad. The beggar said, True, sir. True, sir. True, yeah, tell, sir. <laughs> and he said, the man begin to tell him how he's worthless and he's no ambition and everything. True, sir. True, sir. True. <laughs> and if you go find work for you and all people like you, I mean, true, sir. The beggar, beggar was so humble. He's one of the humblest beggar ever seen. He was just like, true, sir. True, sir. True, yeah, talk, sir. True, yeah, talk, sir. When my friend really tell him and tell him, he said, boy, sir, you know me like you because you talk the truth. <laughs> <laughs> you know that nigga now go and I'm going to get something. <laughs> and I tell him, my friend, give him stuff and I give him stuff because we couldn't get rid of that nigga. <laughs> and when he got rid of that nigga, I have enough man <laughs> <laughs> but if, if, he, if he was arguing with him, uh, he, he would get not matter. If you are going to beg, you can argue. And when you come to Jesus for salvation, anything God said to you, because you are the one in need. True, you tell Lord. True, Lord. Yes, true. True, Lord. And the woman learned the technique. It's the best way to get blessings from God. Is to admit everything that God said is true. Truth, Lord. And notice, even when she finished with that, she's not moving away from Jesus. She said, truth, Lord. Truth, you are telling her about the dog. For the dog. I got into the revised version. For the dogs really eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table, you know. It's truth. You, you're a dog. I'm really a dog. But you know what, Lord? If I have a dog... You are just come for the dog food, the crumbs that fall from the master's table. Me no come for the children's bread. <laughs> come on, now, servant. But the woman already know that the crumbs that fall from the table is of the same substance like the bread. Will you say I'm not out there? She's a lot of here for the sudden look at thing. I am out of the table. Just fast my little bit and I will get my blessing. Will you say I'm not out there? One that Jesus looked at this woman and said, Oh woman, well, what a woman, you man. Oh woman, great is thy faith. You know, a woman like this have to get the blessings from God. I don't know what you want from God. I don't know the needs that you have in your life. But I want to suggest to you that a lot of us can't get anything from God because we complain too much. We argue too much. There are a lot of Christians who God will never bless. Because every day you see them, Lord, you're rough. Why do you know what God I do? Look like I'm a do something for everybody else except me. I don't know what is happening. It seems as though I'm going to sink into depression. I don't know what has been happening. Every day we come to church and everything just stand the same way. Lord, I don't know. You can't get any blessing like that. 
you have to guard yourself and recognize that you are a child of God and even if you're a dog, you deserve dog food. That's what this woman said. The woman said, Lord, I'm not leaving without my blessing. I'm here and I'm here to get my blessing. Oh, woman, great is your faith. Be it unto thee, even as you will. Everything you want, you will get. They say, it's as if Jesus looked at her and said, a woman like you, anything you want from God, you are going to get it. God can't back look for somebody like you. With this kind of dogged perseverance. It is faith like this that caused healing to take place. It is faith like this that caused doors to open. It is faith like this that caused Christians to go from one level to another. It is faith like this that caused great things to occur. Let me tell you, it's when you learn to approach God like this that Christianity has just begun to get sweet. When nothing in the world offends you anymore, when you stop cussing the Bible and start praise God, your life has just begun as a child of God. And Jesus, the Bible said, the demon left the woman daughter that same hour. And the Bible said when Jesus finished, he turned around and he walked back to Galilee. All that distance because the feet of this woman was of such that nowhere in Israel he could find such a feet. Jesus just had to go to her because this woman was not normal. She wasn't the kind of person you can get rid of from church. She's not the kind of person who, who you, God can just lightly push aside. This woman is going to stick with the Lord through thick or thin. Comes what me. Whether she receives bread or she just get in crumbs, she's going to stay. This is the kind of woman that God wants to serve him. This is the kind of faith we need tonight. I want to suggest to you as we look at the word that one of the things that you need is to have this kind of faith in the word. You need to be able to say truth, Lord. Yet. Yet. Some of you are sick. And I'm telling you, brethren, that your sickness will disappear when you have this kind of dogged faith. I've seen it occur. Time and time and time again. I've seen it occur. When people have this kind of dogged faith. Uh, I was talking to Pastor Lewis Mowbray, good friend of mine. We had a prior band when we were at school. We call it the upper room. We used to pray for people and things happen. We pray for people, money come in their account. We pray for people, all kind of things. One night we were praying on the, a little place there. In the dark, a great group of us. And while we were there praying, they brought in a woman in a wheelchair. And they said, we are here for you to pray for the woman. I turned around and I spoke to her a little bit. And I said, do you have enough faith to um, come out of the chair? She said, what do you mean? And we began to talk and we prayed for the woman. And she got up, out of her chair, walk around, start push the chair on the outside. There was a friend, there was a guy there. It's the first time I met him. We call him Powers afterwards. But when he saw what happened, he was so blown away. He was at the prior meeting. The first time you see any healing like that. You know, people who know recognize the power of God, but they see it for the first time. So I was living at Bullet over in the bush. And this guy, when we were go I was going home, I realized he was walking behind me some distance. So I stopped a little bit when I was in the dark for him to catch me up back. And I said to him, I didn't know you live up this side, though. He said, no, man, I live in the opposite direction. So I said to him, where are you going? He said, boy, do you miss the power of God? Are you may walk, father? May I come see where you live? <laughs> so I said to him, Remember, it's not my power, it's the power of God. Furthermore, I said to him, I live in the bush. If you go to my place, I don't know you're going to come back. He said, no worry, man, me sleep on the ground. And you know, he came, 
and he sleep on the ground. And we became good friends. And one of the things that I remember about him is that a little later we, we would live side by side and he would get up every morning and shout at me. Shout, Lord! <laughs> Yet. And sometimes you would hear him crying out early in the morning, sometimes four o'clock, and he would wake me up and he would have to go and pray and he would wake me up with some, some phrase that we use at the prayer meeting and he would be there recognizing the power of God's word. This book will change your life if you will let it. It can get the devil out of your house if you will trust God. It can transform your sick, weak, machiated body if you will allow Jesus to take over. It will change your mind and get rid of the stress that is in your heart if you will just trust the word of God. If you will learn to press, all things are possible. Truth, Lord. Sometimes the word of God is rough, but you must recognize it as truth. Truth, Lord. Let the Lord know truth, Lord. The Lord tell you that you stay bad and you're not that good. Truth, Lord. Yet you say, if I confess my sins, you will forgive it. Truth, Lord. My real stay bad. But you say, Lord, that you will make a man more precious than the gold of offering. Truth, Lord. Truth, Lord. But I come to you, Lord, because you said all things are possible in Christ. I'm going to close with an appeal as I close every night. Please stand. You're here tonight. And you find it difficult sometimes to just cast everything upon Jesus. Sometimes it seems rough for you to accept. Difficult. But tonight you want to say, Pastor, I want you to pray for me that I will accept all that God has said. That like this woman, I will have this dogged perseverance that no matter what the word say, no matter what people say, no matter what them say, what they do, what they, I will stick with Jesus because he's the God of truth. If that is you, I'm going to invite you to come to this altar and I'm going to pray for you. I don't know what your condition is I don't care what your situation is. But if you're here tonight, what you need is the word of God. If you're a sinner and you're here tonight, I can tell you, there is no other place for you to be than at the altar. There is nobody else that can take care of your condition except Jesus. If you're a backslider, I will say to you based on the word of God that you need Jesus. That you're not here by accident. That Christ is here to meet you. Your reason for being here is to have a one-on-one -on -one encounter with God. Truth, Lord. Truth, Lord. Let us pray. Oh, Lord. We thank you for the truth of your word. Sometimes, Lord, it's a hard pill to swallow. Sometimes it's bitter in the mouth. The world is not always palatable. But like this woman, help us tonight as we come to this altar to be able to say, truth, Lord. Help us to swallow our pride and humble ourselves before God. Help us, Lord, to put self aside and recognize that you are the God of truth. Truth, Lord, yet. Lord, our condition is bad. It's true, Lord, that we are lost in sin. True, that we are sold to the devil. True. Oh, Lord, it's all true. True, Lord. The heart is deceitful above everything and desperately wicked. Truth, Lord, there is none that 
do it good. That's true, Lord. It's true, all true. Yet, Lord, we are here because we know that salvation comes only from you. We are here, Lord, like that woman. We are crying for mercy. We are not here, Lord, because we believe we are worthy. We are here, Lord, because it is true. It is true. It is true. It's not good to take the angel's food and cast it to people like us. We know, Lord, but we are here for mercy. Have mercy. Help us, Lord. Help us to plead as this woman plead. We plead for the mercies of God. We plead for the help of God. We are here, Lord, because we are sinners. We are here because we are lost. We are here not because we are good, but because you are good. Not because we are righteous, but because you are righteous. Not because we have any strength, but because the Lord is our rock in him we hide. We come tonight, Lord. With all our burdens, with all the wretchedness of our being. We come bruised, broken, and disgusted, but we are still here at the cross. Discouraged and going through a crisis, but we are here tonight. The body is wrecked with disease and sickness, most of it caused by our own foolishness. Truth, Lord, but we are here, Lord. Here for mercy. Truth, Lord. Truth, Lord. If we had obeyed the laws of health, we wouldn't be in this condition. Truth, Lord. Truth, Lord. Truth. Yet, Lord, you said we should call upon you. So tonight we are here calling upon you. We ask in the name of Jesus that you will extend the healing to your people of mind, body, and soul. We ask, Lord, that we are sinner who has come to this place will recognize that we are sinner bounds. Grace did much more abound. Help them to recognize that you are able not only to save them, but to save them from sin and its power. Jesus, we plead tonight as that woman pleaded, recognizing that only Jesus can make us whole. We ask now that as we go, that you help us to walk in victory. Help us, Lord, to grab hold by stubborn faith on your word, knowing that with Jesus Christ we are more than conquerors. That sins are forgiven, disease is banished, sickness is healed. That woman went away happy because she knew that when Jesus said, Be it unto you, all the blessings that you have given to us, we go, my Lord, happy in Jesus Christ and blessed by your grace. We ask now that the Holy Spirit will guide us as we go to our various destinations. Bring us back tomorrow evening we pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. 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 Touch somebody and something and truth, Lord. The Lord is true. 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 May God be with you as you go. Amen. And amen. <laughs>